black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Sure. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you this evening. And if you notice over this weekend, I've released almost all of the shows, um, member shows and everything as a celebration as we move to uh, revolverpodcast.com. They're now hosting Sasquatch Chronicles. And if you notice on your podcast player, you, you've, you've probably noticed the color has changed on the logo. And uh, it's just uh, my move over to uh, Revolver. And I'm really happy being there. I think the people over there are great. And so I wanted to do something special, celebrate it with everyone, kind of release all the shows this weekend. Uh, just this weekend. Next week, it'll return to normal. But I want to thank you guys for being here, especially on a Sunday night. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Uh, tonight, I'll be talking to Tommy. And Tommy had a horrific childhood. Him and I have talked off the air. In fact, I talked to Tommy almost a year ago, and he refused to come on the show. He really didn't even want to come on the show tonight, uh, but I begged and pleaded with him to come on. And because Tommy's encounter is very fascinating, the backstory is hard to listen to, uh, but the encounter as a whole is fascinating to listen to as far as what happened to him. And I'll let Tommy go into that tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And even though I'm releasing shows this weekend, if you get a chance, go check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member, get additional shows. Uh, there's a daily blog, a lot of cool people on the website. So if you get a chance, I hope you um, go over there and take a look at sasquatchchronicles.com. Uh, but either way, thank you so much for listening tonight. Let's actually jump into it. I want to welcome Tommy to the show. Tommy, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Wes. I, I appreciate I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, and I want you... nervous, kind of, you know. Yeah, and don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Um, it's just you and I having a conversation, but I know it's kind of a painful memory to relive. Uh, the encounter is very fascinating to me. I know the backstory might be hard for the audience to uh, to listen to, but it's, it's important. It, it kind of explains why you were in the situation you were in. Um, if you would, take your time and just kind of start from the beginning. And if you would, how did you get into the situation you're in? And Tommy, you share as many details as you want or don't share any details you don't want to share. Um, and then we'll just kind of walk into uh, this encounter. Okay, Wes. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave a lot of the, the personal details out from why I got to to um, northern Minnesota in um, Willow River, uh, simply because uh, the names have been changed to protect the guilty at this point. Um, I, I grew up in uh, uh, just outside of the Twin Cities in Minnesota, a um, uh, large family. Um, when I was uh, from when I was a young young guy, uh, having some, uh, some serious. Uh, uh, abuse situations happening to me, and I'm what you call a runner. Some people are fighters, and I guess at that age, I didn't, I, I couldn't beat the people that were beating me, and so I ran. So I was, uh, my parents were too busy to deal with a runner, 
having come and fetched me from a few far places that I could hitchhike to when I was, you know, seven years old or whatever. Long and short, um, they had uh, the authorities in the Twin Cities, uh, they filed what they call incorrigible papers on you. And they put you in jail. One of the times that the cops had found, found me after running away, they put me in this juvenile detention center and waited for somebody. Now, back in the 70s, this is like 72, 73, I think. And they would um, they would put people in, the, put young boys that were having problems with the law. They tried to cut that problem short by putting them, getting them out of the city and getting them into some type of a group home is what they called them, or foster homes get them out of the city before they cause any more problems or end up in prison. They, their intentions were good, but they really didn't check into the people very well they were putting kids with. Long and short, I, was, uh, I had a gentleman by the name of Don come and fetch me out of the juvenile detention prison they had me in and um, brought me up to uh, northern Minnesota outside of uh, Willow River. Uh, it's west of Willow River quite a ways. I think it's Finland Sin or somewhere in that neighborhood. I was put up there with uh, three other boys that were brothers. Uh, they were from the Twin Cities also, had some problems with the law, and so they, the, the, because all three of them had problems, they just sent all three of them together. So it ended up being the four of us there. I'm going from where I was, it's like somebody taking me from the fat to the fire or from the frying pan to the fire or whatever because this guy was, he was insane. He, he, was, uh, he, was, he was amazingly physically abusive to both animals and to people. Um, the best way I can describe him is, uh, if, if somebody needs a visual, is um, Clint Eastwood in Heartbreak Ridge. Tall, lean, muscular, angry, cocky, belligerent, flat top haircut, gray hair. That was him. If you can picture that, that's the guy. His name was Don. He had a farm. He had about 80 milking cows, about 200 head of steers. He had sheep. He had pigs. You know, it's a farm. In the early 70s, um, pretty pretty representative of what was around that area at the time. And so uh, at first, it was, you know, at first I thought this is going to be pretty good. You know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with three other guys. Uh, they weren't all my ages. Actually, the youngest of those three boys was my age, and uh, the oldest was just about 18, and I was 12, I think, 11 or 12 or something in that neighborhood. Um, I, I have a real hard time with a lot of these memories because I have these big black holes in my memories from really traumatic things that happened in my life. And, uh, when I was about 15, I didn't know any, I didn't remember any of it. And as I got older, uh, things started to just pop in my head and the things that I couldn't really believe was it, over the course of about five years, all of the memories came back and, uh, um, uh, it, I don't blame you. Tough. Yeah, I don't blame you. And I don't mean cut you off, but I mean, just reading your email, Tommy, was hard for me to read. I mean, I, and you don't have to go into it all of it if you don't if you don't want to. But for the audience listening, this guy was a real monster. I mean, this guy was a flat out monster. So I, I don't mean to cut you off. I don't blame you one bit for no, that's okay. for yeah, I the think, thing is, is that, you know, there's a lot of different kind of monsters out there. And I think I met most of them. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, for some reason, I don't. I feel like I, for a long time in my childhood, I thought I was a target on my back, and I'm not talking about just um, monsters in the woods or just monsters in farmhouses. I'm talking about just uh, monsters out there who preyed on children, who for some reason saw me as a victim to victimize. I don't understand that whole thing. I don't, you know, I I don't know. But anyway, to get back to the story, people people that want to listen to Sasquatch stories, <laughs> not child abuse stories. Uh, the only reason that I'm telling about the abuse is because it happened out in the public or happened in and outside of this guy's barn. And uh, I'll just briefly tell, again, the story that I just told you about the cows, just to give you an idea of what kind of things he did around that farm on a daily basis. Um, this guy had a, you know, he was a, he was a, um, some type of a, um, a commander or, a, or something in the army where he uh, trained troops, like, um, in um uh, you go to boot camp or whatever, he was one of them guys, a CEO or something. So he's one of those loud, big, demanding guys. And he, I don't know why, but he just seemed to have, the, he just hated, I don't know if he just hated animals or he just had no idea how to take care of them or what, but he was so hard on his animals. He had all these milking cows and he'd, he'd run these 80 cows in. I mean, I don't know how many people understand farms or, or farms back in the 70s, but uh, I had no experience with this kind of a farm, but I learned real quick. 
cows come in, they know where to go. They go in their stanchions. You click the stanchions down, holding their neck. They sit in a row on each side of the inside of the barn. And right behind them is the gutter, right under their butt. So when they crap, it goes right in there. And um, they had a vacuum line. It was a vacuum milking system that had these pots. They were stainless steel pots that had the uh, the um, the utter, um, I don't know, which call them suckers or whatever. And they would take this uh, belt and they would throw it over the back of the cow and it had these grommets on it like a belt that you wear and around your waist. And it had like a metal loop on the bottom of it. You'd stick it over the cow and you'd stick the loop, you'd hook it onto the, the grommet on it to adjust to each cow. And you'd uh, wipe out the nipples and you'd turn on, you'd put this vacuum line from there on in front of the cow and you'd uh, turn on and suck, 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 the, it fills up with milk. I think it's about three or four gallons or something. Anyway. This guy, uh, he was <laughs> psychotic. It's, it's the only way I can describe it. He's psychotic. I'm standing there, uh, 11 year old boy, you know, watching what he's doing, and learning what he's doing, and because it, it, anything he did, you're yeah, you pay attention to this because you're going to be doing this tomorrow, kind of a thing. And uh, he'd walk down with that thing in his hand, the milking thing in his hand, machine, and he'd say, Over, oh, Jane, and he hit this cow on, on, let's say, he walks up to two cows and he hits the one on the left. He says, Over, oh, Jane. And he hits the cow in the ass. If that cow don't right now take a step to the left so that he can get between the two cows, put that vacuum line on, that cow's in for some danger, some serious shit. Excuse me. Um, well, of course, cows don't know. They don't know nothing. All I know is there's a grain in front of them when they lock them in the stanchion. Is there grain here? Then, you know, they're fine. But uh, he goes, over, Jane. Cow doesn't move over. Over, Jane. He hits it hard. The cow now is kind of freaking out a little bit, taking some extra steps. It doesn't know what's up. He was getting over, and he hits his cow, and the cow doesn't know what to do. He's freaking out. He's locked. His neck is locked in a stanchion. He's sliding around on the crap that's underneath him, and when the cows get upset, they shit. Oh, I said it again. Sorry. The cows uh, get upset. No, they, right. they crap. And then the, underneath their hooves, it's all slippery now because they, they're freaking out. He gets all upset, and he thinks his cow is purposely trying to break, trying to screw with his day or something. Anyway, so he... he Smacks the cow, kicks the cow, pushes the cow. Now the cow's freaking out, and it's moving, and he's kneeing the cow in the belly, and 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 the cow's not moving over, or it moves over, or it moves back, or it moves against him, and oh god, that was the end of it. If that cow moved the other way and bumped into him, that was it. He throws the milking thing down on the ground, he goes back and gets the pitchfork, comes back with the pitchfork, and starts stabbing this cow in the ass. I mean, on the side of his ass, on the top side of the cow. To move over, wham, wham, wham. This cow is freaking out. This cow is freaking screaming. And it's falling down and it's running around. It's trying to get out. It's trying to escape this madness. I'm standing here watching it and I, I, my jaw is hanging open. I'm like, I, can't, what, it's, I don't understand this. I, I, can't, I don't understand this. Why, why is this guy doing this? And the cow doesn't know what to do. It's freaking out. He's pulling the pitchfork back out. The blood is spurting everywhere. And the cow, of course, he's not going to stand there quietly and wait for you to milk him. Now it's freaking out. It's gone totally berserk. Oh, now the cow's starting to kick at him, trying to get the, you know, the madness away from him. Oh, God, oh, the, the cow's kicking me now? Oh, you, oh, you, sorry, son of a, you know, and he goes and he gets a rope and he ties a rope to that cow's leg and he goes across the, the, the alley or the gutter or whatever to the pole on the other side and he runs that pole around there and cranks it tight until that cow's leg is sticking straight out behind him. And the cow is freaking out. It's falling down. It's getting up. It's moving. It's about to break the whole barn down. And he's doing all of this because what? Because he wants to melt the cow. I, you know, the, I don't think the milk would be any good anymore. Anyway, he finally gets the cow where it's so exhausted, it can't hardly even stand. And then he comes in there and puts the, the thing on and milks the cow. The cow is just, you know, freaking out and panting. And so he does this. Now, that's one cow. Now, he'll go down to the next cow and start the same crap all over again. Or, you know, the other cows, I mean, the cows are stupid, but the other cows, they know something bad's coming <laughs> And they don't even know enough to move. They don't know what the hell the party's about. But he does this after two or three cows. And then this happened regularly. This didn't happen once. This happened all the time. This happened four times a week. Uh, and he, he, after seeing this, I hadn't been there very long, but after seeing this, about the third cow, uh, you know, he, uh, I, he, before that second cow, he told me, he turns around and sees me standing there. He says, get the hell out of here and go and clean the sheep shed or something. I don't mean standing there watching me, kind of a thing. And I'm in the sheep shed, and I hear these cows mooing and screaming and wailing. I come back out. I just It's like I had enough. I just broke. I just had enough. And I came back out, and I yelled at him. I said, yeah. I can't say what I actually said. But I said, you know, if you, 
you, you really think you're a big shot? You really think you're a tough guy doing this to cows? Do it to me. Come on, do it to me. You, you think you're real tough taking a cow tied up, beating on them? Come and get me. Oh, well, you know, do you want trouble? Say that to him. Challenge him. Oh, he chased me all around that barn for 10 minutes. He finally caught me, and he, he tied me to a pole, and he poked me with a pitchfork, and he strapped me with the, he whipped me with the milking straps until the grommets made me bleed. And if you don't believe it, you can check my back. It's full of scars. Um, anyway, that was one day. I was there for 10 months. Jesus. The other day, we'd be out. We would be out in the, and this is the part that's connected to the Bigfoot thing. I know people are going, well, what's this got to do with Bigfoot? Uh, what it has to do with is that's one behavior that happened in the barn. But this kind of behavior with him, the yelling and hitting me and dragging me around and kick, knocking me down and punching me, and this stuff went on every day out in the farm, in the barnyard, in the sheep shed, in the whatever. It could happen while we're putting a fence up uh, right out in the middle of the, of the barnyard. It could happen on a tractor. It could, He's knocked me off a tractor so many times, I can't even tell you. And I'm surprised that I wasn't run over many times. But he'd knock me right off the tractor, just smack me right off it while I was going down the trail if I shifted wrong or something. Anyway, my point is, is that there was a lot of um, abuse and things and torture that were happening to me out in in this farmyard. Where if, if anybody, anybody, just anybody, I mean, even, even the neighbor guy, his name was Gus, nice old man. He had the only other farm around. You know, there's a couple of times that him and his wife would come over with, like, pies or something that they made because they felt so sorry for us kids. And Don would, like, said he'd chase them out of there. Get the hell out of here, you damn crap. These kids don't deserve nothing. Get out of here. They came over because they felt sorry because they could hear us screaming from their house, which was half a quarter of a mile away across the field. Anyway, I think that um, that this, I don't know, the Sasquatch I know now at the time, I called it a monster. But I think that it had been around. I think it heard these cries. I think it had been hearing it all along. I, that's my only assumption of why it even approached me. Anyway, so I told you that story, so I could tell you this one. Uh, I'm a runner. I told you that already. Because uh, I don't think that people should be treated that way, children or adult. And so I would run. I was a pretty good runner. I, I, could, I could run a long way. After about uh, six, seven, eight, six, eight months of this crap going on, I could talk these stories for three hours. I won't. We, um, um, well, I'll back up. One of the, before the, this actual, um, when I saw uh, the creature, um, I was out, there's a, a ras, big, huge raspberry patches that are wild raspberries that were alongside of this cow, this tractor trail that we would take through the woods that went from one field to another field that he bought. We called it the back 40. And we'd go and we'd bale hay back there. Anyway, we a lot of times he would, take the tractor full of hay and he'd make us walk. It's about a mile through there. Ain't no big deal for young kids. But And we'd always stop. You know, we'd go, you know he, he had a sight, and then we'd quickly stop at the raspberry patch and we'd sit and pick raspberries. Uh, one of the times, I was coming back alone, and I saw these raspberries. Ah, nobody's around. I can sit and pick raspberries and eat them. You know, I was always hungry. And I'm eating these raspberries, and I, I was there by myself. I just stopped and started picking these raspberries, and I heard this something moving on, like, I suppose 20, 30, 25 feet from me. I mean, the raspberry patch was humongous. I mean, it's huge. And I heard something moving big, moving in there. I thought maybe it was a bear. I don't even know if there are bear up there. I assume that there is. Uh, but I heard something, and it made this noise, just like a, oh, like a, oh. but so low, though, that um, it, it, it didn't sound like a bear to me, but it sounded huge. Enough that it scared the hell out of me. I was feeling nauseous. I got up, and it took off, just kind of dropped the berries and took off. And started running down the trail. Now the right side of the trail is field. It's the 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 front forty that we um, that we bail. And on the left side of the little trail is all woods. And I'm running back to the farm on this trail, and I can hear something. Whatever that was was now running alongside of me, but far enough into the thick uh, trees that I couldn't see what it was. I just see something was running alongside of me. I kept running and. Uh, I stopped for a second thinking, you know, maybe it's the other guys. Maybe it's, maybe it was them all along. You know, maybe they were, the guys didn't stay there with the wagon and wait for the trailer to come back again or whatever. He'd do so, it's, whatever, it's farming. I thought maybe those guys were sneaking behind me and they're just trying to mess with me. So I stopped for a second to see if I could see who it was. And when I stopped, the noise stopped. And I started running again, and you could hear the noise again. And it's just like clump, clump, clump. Smash, crack. You could hear just cracking, breaking through the trees or branches or whatever. I stopped again, and it stopped. There's no noise. 
I have one, once I yelled, I said, come on, you guys. And I realized there's nobody around it because they would have said something. Bam, I took off around. I didn't slow down until I got back to the farm. Never said nothing to anybody other than uh, once I asked one of the other kids there, I said, were you guys out by the berry test that day on Tuesday or whatever? No, no, we weren't out there. We were sitting there having a smoke, whatever. So that was that time. Something was there. I don't know what it was. You know, maybe it was a bear, but I'm going to assume that it wasn't knowing what I know now. Okay, so I told you all that, so I could get to, uh, let's see. I started running away from there. I mean, he'd, he'd abuse me, and I would run away. And we lived uh, about on this dirt road that there was only one other farm, and that's the one I mentioned earlier. That's Gus's place. Otherwise, there was no other farms, nowhere, either direction, as far as I knew. I mean, you'd get in the car, and you'd ride from town for about a half an hour, it seemed like. And then when you turned on to his road, it was a gravel road, straight, Nothing, just nothing but woods and swamps on either side. And, you know, it, it seemed like it was six or eight miles till you get to his farm. <laughs> so when I ran, when I would run away, well, going out the driveway to the left would mean, I, I assume now, to Finlandson, which I didn't have a clue what that meant because we never went that way driving. We always went the other way. So I would just start running up the road to the right. And uh, I'd run and run and run, and, and, and I always looked to see where I could, get off of the road because uh, it wouldn't take long. He always had an eye on me, and it wouldn't take long for him to figure out that I was gone. And when he did, he'd look around, and he'd say, where's Tommy? He thought he was up in the garden. I don't know where he is. He'd jump in his old LTD, 67 LTD, that just stunk like a cow pie inside. It just, just annoyed me how much it stunk, and it's because he always was in it with his cow clothes, you know. Anyway, he'd always come looking for me. He'd always catch me. It happens all the time. It happened... I don't know, six, eight times. I would run down the road. I'd hear his car coming. You couldn't see it yet. You could just hear it coming. And I would jump off the road. But there's swamps on both sides of the road. Um, now, I've checked a map recently. Now, that area's changed a lot. Maybe it was high that year or something. I don't know. But there's not swamps like that anymore. But this is 45 years ago. So, anyway, I would jump off, and I would try to just kind of hide alongside the road. It was really easy to see it because there's nothing but, you know, the road, of swamp and then nothing but thick woods on the other side of that. And I'd, I'd duck down, he'd go by, he'd hear the brakes, he'd jump out and yell and scream and smack me around, and he'd grab a, uh, a length of rope out of his trunk and he'd tie my wrist to it and he'd tie the length of rope to his trailer hitch and he'd start driving me back. And he'd make me run behind the car. Well, I, can only, I just ran two and a half miles or so, I'm exhausted. He hooked me up to it. I could only run so far, and eventually I'd fall, and I'd be yelling, screaming, stop, stop. He would stop. He'd drag me all the way back home. I got scars to show you that, too. Anyway, so this happened many, many times, six, eight times, like I said. And uh, I'm starting to get a little smarter, or I'm thinking I'm smarter. I'm not any smarter. I'm a little kid. I'm scared. And I'm trying to get away, and I don't know what else to do. So I run. But um, this last time that I ran, second to the last time that I ran, um, I should back up just a little bit. One of those couple of those times when I was running up that road, I could hear noises from the woods, which I'm not good with yards. I'm better with feet. I would say it's, I don't know, 300, 500 feet, let's say, 500 feet to the woods. But between the road and the woods is swamp, mucky, thick swamp with reeds and cattails and the whole nine yards. And um, I could hear something in those woods every once in a while when I was, I just had a bad feeling. Every time I ran up this road, I'd get by the certain area where the, the second farmer, Gus's property ended, and then it was all thick woods all the way up to the highway, which is what, six, seven miles. Anyway, that bunch of woods on the right side as I'm going north, I always just had a bad feeling, weird noises coming out of it. Now I, I realize that they were whoops and they were grunts. There were howls, different things that I would hear different times when I was running up that road. I just thought it was, you know, whatever, animals make those noises, so I just would keep running. But anyway, um, sometime I'm running up the road, and Don, and I just, I see the swamp, and I see the woods on the other side of the swamp, and I hear Don's car come, and I go, damn it, he caught me already. And I jumped down into the weed, into the off the side of the road, into the ditch, like I've done several times before. And he always catches me, always sees me in the ditch. For some reason that day, he didn't see me. Maybe he was looking out the other side or something. But he went by. He went by. I started running in through the swamp, hoping I could get to the woods. I figured if I get to the woods, he can't see me. I could take the woods all the way up to the main highway. 
I had a friend that lived on the corner of his street in the main highway, which I figured was six miles, eight miles, something like that. I figured I could get to my friend's house. He had a real nice mom, and he she was a single mother trying to take good care of her kids. And um, there was a few times that I had to uh, run away that I got almost to their house. And I, I always thought if I could get to their house, if I could just get to their house, I could get some help. Anyway, I jump into these. I hear his car coming. I jump in the ditch. He goes by. I, I continue going through the swamp. And I realized pretty quick that it's really mucky underneath of the, underneath of the water. I, thought it was, I don't know. I just didn't realize what I was getting into. I start going into the swamp, and the further and further I get, the worse it is. The more thick the muck is underneath of the water. And it's like I'm stepping in, and it's pushing. The muck's going all the way up like, past my knees. And I'm wearing these, what they call back then, were called duck boots. They're green boots with a yellow line around the bottom of them. Probably people think they're popular now, but back then we called them duck boots and we hated them. But they were like knee highs for working on farms. I start, uh, I start struggling and struggling. I'm having a hell of a time getting each foot out of the muck and into the next step, but I know i got to get across these woods. Um, I'm about, I would say, three-quarters of the way across the swampy area, and I'm into where the thick cattails are. And I'm really panicking now because I I don't think I'm going to make it. I, I mean, now the water is up to my chest. The muck is up to my knees. And I can't, and I'm getting so tired that I can't get my feet. Each step, I can't get my feet out of this muck. It's like it's sucking them in. And I keep going. I keep going. I'm, I'm struggling. And now I'm starting to freak out because the water's getting up to my neck. And I, can, if I, I don't know how to explain this, but if you push down with one foot, just pull the other foot out of the muck. The first foot, the first foot is going in deeper. You end up digging yourself a hole, basically, is what you're doing. And uh, of course, I'm just panicking, uh, and I'm getting swamp water in my mouth. And I'm trying to get through, and um, I start, I start crying, I start screaming and crying because I think I'm going to drown now because I'm getting to where if I stop, it sinks, and if I keep struggling, I kind of get moving a little more, but at least I can keep my chin above the water. And then I'd find a little clump of uh, cattails or something. I'd be grabbing them and pulling them toward me and pull my feet out of the muck underneath. Anyway, I'm right into all that. I'm panicking. I'm freaking out. I don't think I can do this any longer. I don't think I'm going to be able to stay afloat. I honestly think I'm going to drown right where I am. And all of a sudden from the woods, which are now, uh, I would say, I don't know, 50 feet, 30 yards, I don't know, it, uh, not too much farther, uh, I would say there was uh, the swamp went right up to the edge of the woods. So um, I would say there was probably, I don't know, 75 feet, whatever that is in yards, 30 yards, whatever. And I hear this crash, bash, crap through, coming through the woods. I'm not sure what I'm thinking. I'm not, I don't know what I'm hearing, but I'm thinking this is bad because I can't even run. I can't, and it just crash, crash, crash. Right away, so this happened really fast. It's bang, crash, crash. And out of the woods comes this freaking monster. It just, I mean, it's huge. It, it, was, it was huge. It was as wide as the barn door. I mean, I'm not kidding. It was huge. It come out, splash, 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 and it jumps. It just, it walked through that swamp like, like it was three inches thick. It just walked right out to me. And I'm watching it as it gets close to me, and I'm now I'm, I see it coming, and it's huge. Uh, it was like dark brown with lighter brown hair. Not fur, but hair, and it was long and straggly, like um, like a ghillie suit or something. It was long. It was dirty, and the the hair on the top on the, the the top hair was lighter, like a lighter brown, like it had been sun bleached or something. But all the hair underneath was real dark. And he comes out, and and it's got breasts. It's a female. It's the first thing I noticed. The thing had breasts, but it was a monster. As far as I'm concerned, it's a monster. And I immediately I see it and it's stomping out towards me and it had I don't know, it had this look on its face like it was like I'm done you know like it was going to eat me or whatever I, it just it was not good I did whatever it was and what was coming at me I I panicked and I turned I turned now I'm trying to go back to the road and I'm stuck I'm st- I, I, I can't get I can't move I I, I stop long enough to see what the hell's coming at me long enough for me to sink in this muck and I can't get out of it. And now the water's up to my, right up to my chin, and I'm choking, and I'm screaming and yelling, and I'm not saying anything, just screaming. And I turned, and I, I struggled so hard, I pulled the boots off. I took, I pulled hard on that the boot came off, and I got another step, and I pulled the boot up, and I got another step. Now I got nothing to help me. It's like I sunk even faster. Without the boots on, it went right into it. By that time, I'm seeing this, this shadow coming up behind me, and the noise, and 
<laughs> comes up behind me, and I just put my hands over my head and cower down, expecting to be, you know, whatever, killed. And this thing just stops right next to me, and I can smell it. God, it was the worst smell. It's still the worst. My dad owned a garbage company, to tell you. I know what bad smells are, the worst. That was the worst smell I ever smelled in my whole life since then, even since then. It was, to me, how to describe that, um, dead skunks um, waiting in a pile of dog crap after they vomited on it. I don't know, it's just a really bad smell. And it's standing right next, right behind me. I didn't even turn to look anymore. I got my hands over my head, and I'm soaking wet, and I'm sinking, and I'm starting to spit and cough out the swamp water, the, the little green things that are in the swamp. And the thing just reaches out and grabs the back of my jacket right behind my neck and reaches and pulls me right up out of that, like, right up out of the water. And, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. This is how, how, how you can describe it. This thing grabbed me, and it's holding me out in front of it. And the only thing I can think of is when I was a kid, you know, we used to have puppies and stuff, and they or, or rabbits or something. They always say, grab a rabbit by the back of the neck there. They're just fine with that. They don't have a problem with that. That's what I felt like. I felt like I was the size of a rabbit to a human. I mean, this thing was huge. It just grabbed me and pulled me right up out of the water and starts walking towards the, the road that I just came from. I'm screaming, I'm swinging my arms, and I'm hitting the arm that's trying to hold me, or that is holding me. I'm hitting this arm, and it's just, it's wet, and it's stinky, and it's strong, and I'm just going to call it she. Stomp, 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 stomp. Goes right back through the swamp the same way I came and gets to the edge of the road and just drops me down, soaking wet, into the mud puddle. That's uh, kind of like a, whatever, the edge of the, the, the ditches are all water, too, and just drops me down in the ditch. And just stands there and stares at me. And I'm screaming and I'm crying and I'm, you know, I'm cowering and, and um, I... I what, what do you do when you see a monster? You know, I saw monsters in the movies. Uh, I've seen a Wolfman. I've seen Frankenstein. I don't know what this is. And I didn't think monsters were real. I thought they were only in the movies. This so happens really kind of in a, some kind of a shock or something because I'm just freaking out. I'm screaming. It's basically what I'm doing. I'm screaming. Ah, ah, I'm screaming. And it, it doesn't do anything. It's just standing there. It just threw me down and standing there looking at me. And I'm not looking at it. I'm looking at the ground. I'm not really looking at anything. I had my hands over my head, and I've got my face down. I'm waiting for it to just freaking pounce on me or something. It doesn't. Nothing's happening. It's just standing there. I can just hear it going. It took, like, these breaths that were, like, ten times my breath. It seemed like it never stopped exhaling. And it just it was just standing there. And, and all of a sudden, everything just got really quiet. And it's just like I'm going, okay, you're not going to kill me or what? And so I stopped screaming. I turned around, and I looked at it. And uh, this is, it's a hard part to talk about. Uh, I know it's a monster. It's um, brown, brown, uh, brown hair, um, gray skin. Uh, I, the first thing I thought of was, for some reason, somewhere I saw uh, a picture of or a movie of the the uh, the circus freak, the the lady with the beard, uh, the yeah. gray bearded lady. That's the first thing I thought of was, it's a woman, she's got breasts, but it's not a woman, it's a monster. It's got long, long hair coming right from below its eyes all the way down off of its face. Uh, nose didn't have hair on it. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the hair, uh, like it had a receding hairline. Didn't, the hair didn't come like all of its eyebrows, which were huge, but it had the, head, the uh, forehead was larger than most, and went back from there. But it, it, its hair was dirty, and uh, it had uh, a piece of branches, keep around mud and crap, and it, it, it was dirty. And uh, uh, it's like his mouth is in the wrong place. Uh, her mouth is lower, like from uh, from your nose to your chin. It, it, there's a lot of more distance there, and it it was just huge. It didn't it didn't uh, it didn't growl. It, it didn't speak. It did nothing. It just it just looked at me, and it looked like it, it, it's kind of hard to explain. But it looked at me like with sympathy. I don't know if that makes any sense coming from a monster. I mean, you don't look it at does. a dog and see sympathy or something. Yeah. But that thing looked at me with these angry eyes, and at the same time, it was kind of like, kind of cocked its head a little bit to the side and looked at me. And 
I don't know, it just looked at me, and I, and I, uh, I, I thought, it's like I saw it, like, uh, okay, um, you're not going to kill me then. And then about that time, I mean, it was just, this is all went by in, like, seconds, but about the time, I heard the gravel of Don's car coming from a mile away or something. You could just hear, when you're out in the country on a gravel road, and you're standing there, and it's nice and quiet, you can hear a car coming from a mile and a half away. You can hear the car coming. He had turned around and started coming back. This thing heard it about the same time. Oh, and I think she heard it before I did because she turned her head, looked up the road, and um, turned back again, looked at me, turned, and just bolted. Didn't run, just walked fast. <laughs> right back through where exactly where I just came from, same trail that we took, same one that I took out. It took, walked right down, went into the, into the, the woods, gone. You could hear crash, come more crash, crash, crash. I was laying there in a ditch, and about, whatever, 20, 30 seconds later, Don rolls up, slams on the brakes, takes one look at me, and starts cussing. I can't use those words on your show. I'll abbreviate them. What the heck heck are you doing? You sorry, son. What the hell are you all? What what did you stink? Where the hell are your shoes? Get the hell up here. And now I'm crying again. And he said, I wouldn't even put, I wouldn't even put you in my car. You're such a goddamn mess. He grabs his, he grabs his keys this time. I don't know, maybe he didn't have his rope. I, I kind of look at him, he grabs his keys. So I'm standing there all wet going, oh, no drag today? He grabs the keys and he opens his trunk. He goes, get your ass in there. And he throws me in the trunk and shuts the door and drives us back to the farm. As we go back to the farm and uh, that's, it's, I don't know what it is, five, six o'clock. So, so I'm starting to go down or whatever at that time. But anyway, he take all that crap up and throw it down there and take all my clothes off and down to nothing. If you try to leave your underwear on or he says take all your clothes off and you leave your underwear on, <laughs> you know, you might as well have a jacket on. Anyway, take all your clothes off, take all my clothes off. They stunk. They were really, you could really smell. It's like I was rolling around in skunks or something. It was bad. He had me take all my stuff off. And <clears throat> they had this uh, old bathtub, an old cast iron bathtub that they had. They didn't have an indoor, oh, didn't, they don't have an indoor farm. I mean, this is a farm, right? You know, you take crap in an outhouse, you know. They made us do all that, but they had indoor plumbing. They had a shower and a toilet in the basement that they had put in recently. But we couldn't use it. We had to use the outhouse. We had to bring buckets of water, five-gallon buckets of water out from the hand crank uh, well and pour it into this cast-iron bathtub, and that's where we took our bath. And... Um, he made me do that, of course. Threw me a bar of soap, the good stuff cleaned up, and they apparently they they made me. Ch- I couldn't get the I couldn't get that smell out of the jacket. I just could not get it out, no matter what I did. But I made me throw it away. He was really pissed about that too. Well, he thought that was the worst thing he could ever done is throw a jacket away, a perfectly good jacket, just because it smelled. That was the worst thing he could ever do. Anyway, long short of it, that uh, that's that's what happened there. There was uh, one other thing that I briefly mentioned to you, Wes, that. Um, we went hunting uh, across the street from his house, and uh, at the time, I didn't think too much of it. Now, looking back and watching videos and stuff of people that have uh, all this structure and stuff from Sasquatch, when we went hunting, we'd do these, um, I don't know, what pushers or whatever they call it, where everybody stands in a big, huge line, and you push and you scare all the deer out to the road, and the guys shoot them from the road. And we were walking through there, and there's all these structures, those hoops, those uh, branches that have been, the trees that have been pulled over. And I uh, saw so all kinds of stuff like that, like a teepee, like, you know, uh, wood piled up like a teepee. I saw all that stuff in these woods, and we were rushing through there, and I never thought anything. I'm a kid. I just noticed that they were there, but I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't know what they're for or if they had any significance to anything to me then. They didn't. But I just remembered that when I started seeing videos of other people showing structures, um, like that um, Noel. Uh, yeah, Christopher, Christopher Noel. Noel. Yeah. Yeah. I, he... Uh, I really like that guy, by the way. Um, he, he, he talks so eloquently and so intelligently, and he knows what he's talking about, and I just love listening to his stuff, too. Anyway, uh, yeah, I saw, so I saw some structures out there when we were out hunting once. Um, we weren't actually hunting. We were doing the slave labor, so he could shoot the deer with all of our tags. That's how that went. But I don't know. Um, that's, that's my and Bigfoot story. And does it no, matter how I left there or? No, no, and I appreciate you sharing it, Tommy. And for the audience listening, I mean, this has been, what, Tommy, a year in the works? You know, I know um, you had contacted me this story a long time ago, and 
I know you, you really didn't want to come on, I guess, for the audience listening. You really didn't want to come on. And I begged and begged and begged and, and begged and pleaded with you to come on because I really think it's a it's a fascinating account as far as – well, before we get into descriptions, I want to go back to that creature. One thing I want to say to you, Tommy, is, you know, when when things happen in your life – um, and I can't relate to what happened to you. I mean, I, most people probably can't relate to what happened to you. You can sympathize, you can empathize, but you can't relate, you know, to what actually happened to you. But a lot of times when people are in those situations, one of two things happens. Either they become the hero or they become the villain. And most of the time in life, people become the villain. It's kind of like the conversation you and I had before we went on the air if something bad happened to you throughout your life, generally you'll treat people the same way throughout your life. So you become the victim, the villain, um, and you didn't, you know, and, and you're a good father and you're you're kind to your kids. And, and I know you got a big heart and I admire you a lot, actually, for everything that you went through to come through at this point in your life and be a strong person. Uh, Sasquatch aside, just to be a strong person for all the crap that you went through. Uh, I admire you, man. I, I admire and I respect you a lot for what you went through and what you had to deal with and, and where it's taken you in life. And the fact that you don't do that to your kids or you don't treat people the way you were treated growing up. Because it's very easy to fall into – to become the villain in life. If bad things happen to you, it's very easy to become the villain and you've chosen not to. And I just admire you and I respect you a lot and I wanted to say that publicly uh, because you and I have talked a lot off the air, and so, you know, I, I just respect you for it. Going back to this creature that you ran into, I find the encounter fascinating because there is situations like this to where they almost have empathy for you, uh, where there is some strange humanity in these creatures to where they're not all just monsters to rip you apart. I think, and it's the humanity you'll find sometimes with these creatures is far and few between in your situation, I think it just felt sorry for you. Um, but I wanted to ask you, when you were looking at this thing, can you kind of describe a little bit more of the face? Did it remind you more of a human? Did it remind you more of a non-human primate? Um, it, it didn't appear to me to be like a gorilla or a monkey. It appeared to me to be a monster. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. And I could tell you what I saw as far as the features go. Um, but it, it looked like a monster to me. You know, the funny thing is, is that, um, the, the stupid referral, I know it sounds ridiculous to even use it, but that freaking beef jerky commercial with that Sasquatch thing, you know, whatever, something Sasquatch, anyway. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it had a lot of similarities to it, because when I first saw that commercial, I went, wow, that looks a lot like it. But at the same time, not. It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It, uh, its hair was kind of like that, where its hair went all over, and it came off its face like a, like, for, it's like the hair came like from, right from under the eyes, all the way down off its face. So its whole face is covered with hair. And we're in, we're in northern Minnesota, so, you know, that would, you know, biologically, if I wanted to grow, I'd like to have thick hair on my face too. and live out here, but, but its nose was flat and wide. Uh, I think I said in the blog something like a like a boxer's head, but yeah, I've heard that said many times since but uh it was definitely the hair though you could see through the hair to the skin it wasn't like a fur where all you saw was fur like on a bear or something you could see through the hair to the skin which was a like a gray like a ash gray a, a medium gray eyes were big uh, set back deep they were huge they were the sizes though know, i'm sure they're bigger than like a coke can or something like the bottom of a coke can they're huge but so the this thing was huge. I mean, when it grabbed me by the scruff of the neck, when it grabbed the back of my jacket and lifted me up, I felt like a rabbit to a human. It was that much bigger than me. I literally, I mean, it, I was laying on the ground, so I didn't, like, stand up and measure myself to it. But I'll bet you that if I stood up, I didn't go farther, much past uh, its knee, or maybe a little higher, halfway into its thigh. But that's it. It was that much bigger than me. And uh, the eyes were dark. I, like I said, I was cowering so much of the time that I didn't let, I didn't, for some reason I felt like I should not look at this thing. And I, I kept cowering. I was screaming. I was cowering. My hands were over my head. And when it was carrying me, I was facing forward, and it was walking, so I didn't, couldn't see it. And I was flailing and smacking my arm against its, against its forearm, trying to get free. 
I didn't know where it was going. I don't know, maybe it was taking me back to feed me to its kids or something. I don't know. But um, as far as how it looks in the face, dirty hair, um, beard, I already mentioned the breasts, and really um, big mouth and not big lips. They were, they were closed. I never, like, saw any teeth. It didn't, like, bear its teeth at me or anything like that. Yeah, I almost wonder if the creature had, obviously, had probably heard what was going on on that farm and, you know, just kind of saw you as, you know, maybe it didn't. I don't know. You could probably answer that question better than I could. But I can just imagine it seeing you stuck there. And it's kind of like a hunter who's hunting a deer. And then all of a sudden, a deer gets caught on something. And I've seen videos that maybe this is a bad example, but bad illustration. But you'll see hunters where they'll free the deer and let it go. And they're not going to harm it. And it, it almost makes me wonder if it looked at you and it just felt sorry for you and decided it would pull you out of that out of that mess instead of moving on or killing you. It's very fascinating. Don't you think the, the behavior is fascinating, how it, it, it really did help you out? Yeah, I agree. It's, I think somewhere I said that the, the, the monster returned me to the monster. I don't know which was worse, drowning or going for another drag. I don't know. I think I, at the time I said I'd rather get drugged than, than drowned or something to that effect. But to, to, to comment on what you just said, I didn't look at the thing very much, uh, but when I did look at it, it had, uh, I don't know how to explain this, and if it makes you sound like a kook, great, I don't care. But it's almost like it was talking to me without words, and I don't mean like a mental retarded or something like that. It's almost like it was saying, it's, it's easier to just bring you off of the road and put you back with the guy than it is to have, you know, what's going to happen? I, I don't know how to explain this, but it's almost like I was a pain in its ass. It's almost like, you know, you're stuck out here. You're just going to bring trouble. You're going to bring people. You're going to bring problems to my area. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like it was a dog. Uh, you know, it's like, it's kind of like getting a dog off the freeway, you know? It's like, if I need a damn dog out here, somebody's just going to hit it. It's going to mess up the traffic and we're going to be stuck in it all day. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of like that. It's, it's almost like, oh, I better just throw your act out here because you're just going to bring trouble. And I think the, the other thing is that, uh, like I said, we hunt and stuff around there. Uh, I'm not much of a hunter, but I was involved in the hunting and sighting rifles and shooting. They would sight rifles in the backyard so you'd hear the guns going off and all that. I think that it's probably had run-ins with guns and didn't see me as a threat. But I almost feel like it, maybe it had some, some compassion but I think that it more thought that it was probably, I don't know, my guess is that it would have been a bigger hassle to let me drown there and have a bunch of people looking for me. Maybe, I don't know why I would think that way. But, um, oh, I understand. I understand yeah, what that's you mean. my assumption. Yeah, it's fascinating. It, it really is fascinating. Did, did anything else happen on that property? So Don picks you up. God, I'd love to get my hands on that guy. Uh, Don picks you up and you guys go back. Did anything else happen more around that property before you left? No, I, I left shortly after that. I ran away again, and uh, I ran down the road past that same area again, I don't know, like a week later. And I kept running. I made it to the, the guy, the kid who lived on the corner. We're going to call him Eli because that's all I know of him. And his mother, uh, his Eli must have been telling his mom stories about me for a long time because his because I come to the door, and I, I ran, and it was just before dark, and I thought, well, if I run now, I can run in the dark and he won't see me and I did I was able to go to get away I got all the way up this road to the main highway and his his mom and his sister younger sister lived in a little motor mobile home across the street on the highway I ran to their house and uh, she knew she knew who I was never met her before she knew exactly who I was she was a, a nice woman she immediately brought me in changed my clothes and she called uh, uh, the, the they call it a constable in those days it's a sheriff that donates his time or whatever. They didn't have, like, cops and stuff that ran around up in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, uh, they brought me to him, or he came out and got me in this old squad car, kind of like a Mayberry kind of a thing. He brings me back to his house and uh, starts calling authorities, and I didn't give him much information other than where I was. It seemed like this is the weird thing is that this whole town knew that this was going on with me. This whole town knew it. Because when I would come to school with all kinds of scars and stuff, Kids all knew there's something up with me, but nobody did anything. They all kept their mouths shut and minding their own business. And so anyway, that's how I escaped there. I was in, I was brought back to the cities, and um, the guy was brought up on charges, and he um, 
because I wouldn't I, I, because I wouldn't testify against him, which is only because I was standing across the room from him and I was scared to death. He just lost his license, wasn't able to do that, and I think he um, he lost most of his cows because he didn't have the income anymore, something to that effect. But that's that story. But um, never never had any other encounters there because I left. I told you about the raspberry patch. I told you about the hunting. There was weird no- there was weird noises in that place all the time. But I just thought they were like timber wolves or something. Oh, there was. We've had a few. Uh, uh, we had some calves that came up dead that were usually left in the barnyards, but they were found out in the middle of the fields and they were. I don't know. They were mutilated in weird ways. Um, like all their meat and everything wasn't gone. It'd be like one leg missing off the back of the calf and its guts guts missing. That's it. Calf be laying out there. We fight and. And Don always said it was uh, wolves. But if it was wolves, wouldn't it be like blood scattered all over and the whole thing torn apart? It wasn't. It's just yeah. like the back leg off of his calf is missing and the guts are missing. That's it. So yeah. we had a couple of things like that happen. Had some dogs missing. Um, the noisy dogs always disappeared, if that makes sense. Uh, the quiet dogs always hang, hung around. Noisy dogs always disappeared. Yeah, it's fascinating, especially the cow story. Um, what, what do you think that these creatures are? What's, what's your honest opinion, Tommy? I mean, you got a you. Uh, your encounter is probably one that most people don't get. They don't get to get this close to one of these things. Uh, what's your honest opinion? What do you think that they are? I think they've been here as long as we have. Um, you know, it goes back to how much you believe about the Bible and about um, ancient aliens and all of that stuff, and that they're some kind of a hybrid from us, or if they're some kind of a genetic experiment from someone from some other planet, or maybe they're just another wild animal or another animal that are an offshoot of uh, you know the Gigantopithecus or the the apes or something. I think they're absolutely intelligent. There's no doubt in my mind that that thing was smarter than me. There's no doubt in my mind that that thing knows what it's doing. It had no, you know. Uh, what is it? It's, I think it's some. It's, it's another uh, gene off of the humans. Um, maybe we came from them. I don't know, but um, it's not. It's not a wild animal, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's an intelligent animal that lives and doesn't only survive, but it thrives away from humans, and it knows to stay away from humans. That's why it survives. I don't have no problem with them in the woods. I just let me know which ones they're in, so I can stay out of it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Whatever became of Don? Um, that's another story. Uh, how much time we got? Well, I'm just curious on what he, whatever became of him, if he ever got a taste of his own medicine or whatever became of the scumbag. Well, I'll, uh, I'll give you the short version, then the one that takes about a minute. Um, short version is uh, God took care of him. And the long version of that is... Uh, about 10 or 15 years later. Now, I didn't mention uh, while we were on the air that um, my brother also was at the same group home. And he was there before me. He's also a troublemaker, and I don't even know the monsters that had been in his life, but all I know is that he was in trouble and then was at this place. And But he was older than me, so he and Don didn't mess with the older guys because he, he had to f- physically fight them, and they were puberty. You know, they are young, tough guys that came from the east side, and, you know, he didn't mess with Kids like that, you know, put a knife in you while you're asleep. So Don didn't mess with those guys. He messed with the ones that he knew that he could control, that he could power over, and that was me. I was the youngest one there. So, um, but my brother was there. When I came there, he left. They let him leave, and they had me come in to, to take his place. My point is that about 15 years later, me and my brother got a belly full of beer, and we start talking a little bit about Don and his craziness, and we said, we got to go up there and get that son of a yeah, we should. Yeah, that's just do it. Let's get a case of beer. We're going to drive up there from the cities. We're going to get that guy for all he did and blah, blah, blah. So we did. We drove up there with venom in our hearts and, you know, and and we just were going to kill this guy. And we drive up there. We had a hard time finding it. I mean, that's, I was so young. I didn't know the highways or anything. But now that I knew the highways, I had to try to figure out where it was. So we went to his house. He had a couple uh, younger kids at the time. When I was there, they were just little, they were like four years old. Well, now they're, you know, whatever, 18 years old and two big guys, they're twins, and they, we pull up and they come out. I was like, they're my friends. Hey, how you doing? How you guys doing? Hey, come on in and see my dad. You know, like nothing had ever happened. It's not like we were all a bunch of buddies or something. I mean, my brother, you know, got like knives in our pockets and we're just, you know, we just, we're just really upset. And 
we're like, oh, where's your dad? You know, and it's like, yeah, he's in the house. Come on in and say hi to him. You know, they thought we were all friends. They didn't have a clue what happened. We went in the house. They opened the door. Come in the house. Yeah, I guess who's here? Around the corner, he comes in a wheelchair. The guy had always had this flat top, like I told you, this flat top haircut um, like Clint Eastwood in that movie. He didn't anymore. He looked like Sean Connery from uh, the movie Alcatraz. He had this long gray hair, way long, way past his shoulders. He totally let himself go, real sickly, couldn't walk, dying of cancer, just about to die. Matter of fact, he died like a week later. He comes strolling and he sees us and he takes one look at us. He can see we're angry, upset, and he's going, well, I suppose you boys came here to get an ounce of something. I don't know what that means. Or get, get a pound of something. I don't know what that means, but something means something. He says, I suppose you're here to get a pound of something. I think that means vengeance or something. And uh, Joey's like going, after this, he turns around and walks out the door. I'm standing there by myself, and it's like all that hate and all that venom and all that terribleness, it just, it just washed out of my body in that instant. It just all washed out, and I went, you know what? Thanks. God got him for us. And he died a week later. Yeah. Well, good for him. I hope he's uh, rotting in hell somewhere uh, because, you know, that's very soci- sociopath-like behavior. Especially when you start, you, you really start getting into some of these serial kill. Uh, can we talk? Some of these serial killers, and they start out abusing animals, and then children, and then they eventually move on to killing people. And I mean, that's terrifying to think that this guy was in charge of troubled youth. You know, that coming out to his farm. I mean, what the hell was going on? I'm sure your story is not unique. I'm sure a lot of this went on back in the day, um, and it's tragic. It really is tragic, and I'm glad you were able to let it go, you know, and even though it would have felt better to, you know, knock him over in his wheelchair and crack his skull, um, but like you said, God took care of it. You know, it's funny. sure is funny how life has a weird way of coming back and teaching you a lesson, and I think uh, the lesson was taught in his case, especially dying of cancer. That's a terrible – my dad went of cancer, and it is a terrible, long, drawn-out – a yes, terrible death, absolute terrible death, yeah. Yeah. and, it, and uh, you know, it, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, go no, go ahead. No, I was going to say that you know he had a, he had twin sons and he had a daughter. I think he had another older daughter that was like moved back to the cities as soon as she could, as soon as she turned eighteen or whatever. But these two kids, of his or his three angels, t- totally treated him like angels. Never touched him, never beat him, never yelled at him. They couldn't do wrong. It was only us that. And he acted upon, and I didn't understand that. I thought, you know, thought that was I thought it was very much uh, um, singled out. Yeah, and it crazy. sounds like you were. It sounds like you were. I mean, what kind of a monster well, drags a kid behind a car, or beats a kid, or what kind of a monster even takes a uh, pitchfork and starts stabbing a cow? I mean, really, what's what's wrong? You know, and, and yeah, that was just the cows. He did it to his pigs. He did it to sheep. He, he did it to dogs. He did it to everything. Well, and that shows you that's what it's one story. This is a Sasquatch program. That's why I'm not telling you about all the crap that he did. But, no, no, no. Know, I, it just it terrified me because I couldn't believe that people would treat animals that way. Why would you have animals if you're going to do that to them? Well, it's a control thing, you know, just like with you. That's why he didn't pick fights with the 18-year-old guys because he probably would have got his ass handed to them. And, but in your situation— well, that's why he didn't pick fights with the younger boys, too, because if one of the older brothers saw the younger one getting it, They'd be on top of him. He knew that. He could see that. Those three brothers were locked together. They were tight. You weren't going to mess with one, you're going to mess with all three. And he knew that, so he stayed clear of them. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to – it's one of the few times you'll hear me say I'm glad he died of – someone died of cancer, and I'm I'm joyful that someone died of cancer. And maybe that's just me. I, I just hate people like that, you know, cowards and bullies, and I just can't stand them. Maybe that's the reason the Sasquatch stay hidden, because humans are so terrible. You know, they're just – you know, I mean, even people yeah. start hearing that they're actually the Sasquatch. What do they do? They load their guns and they get in trucks. Hey, let's go kill the monster. You know, even I knew, even at that age, that it's not like I wanted to kill it. I just didn't know what it was. I just didn't know what it was. It's huge and foreign to me, and I didn't understand it. And uh, but I still, I didn't want it dead because it, you know, it's whatever. I just, I still to this day don't think they should kill them. But I think that, you know, you said a long time ago, yeah, I guess maybe one will have to be sacrificed so that we can prove the species. But, you know, the government's got a hundred of them already. That's nothing new. They just keep it at yeah. because they don't. It's a financial thing to the government, I'm sure. Yeah. 
Well, I think it runs probably deeper than that, but I tend to agree with you. I think they've already killed they've already killed these things a million times over. And so there's really yeah. you know, if you kill one and bring it in, you're only if you get if you're able to bring it in, you're only gonna prove it to the public. Government's well aware of it. Um but you know, going back to your encounter, Tommy, you know, I, I just I respect the fact that you came on the show. I know you really didn't want to come on the show. And I think that's important for the audience to understand. I mean, I had to grab Tommy by the ear and drag him on the show. Not really, but um, and I'm so yeah, glad. One longer than the other. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm so glad that you did, honestly, because uh, I I love well, the encounter. You know, the the horrific story around the encounter is hard to listen to, and I know you barely touched on it, but the encounter itself is is fascinating, really fascinating to me, because I've heard other encounters like this to where. There's this weird humanity in them, you know, and I, I think you and I've talked about the Curious George story I told you about, uh, where the this yeah. female dragged this kid back eight miles through sticker bushes back to camp, and it's like, well, what do you make of that? Um, it, but the problem is, is that you can't your situation and some of these other situations. That's not what happens every time, and so you kind of have to go on the side of caution. When you run into these things, because what you ran into may not be what someone else runs into. Um, but I, I really I love the story because I, I, you know, I love the whole encounter because it shows compassion. It had compassion for you. And whether you think it was just trying to get you out of here, and you're probably right if that's what you're thinking. Um, but in the same breath, it didn't have to save you either. It could have just moved on and you would have been yeah. drowned in the swamp and old Don probably would have found you. Um, so, well, you know, that's why the only reason I thought the backstory was important was because maybe it did show compassion. Maybe it saw all of the problems I was having there. Maybe it felt, maybe it had its own children in the woods somewhere and saw that and just went, you know, that's no way to treat a child, you know, or whatever. And that's why I think there was a connection there. I think that it had been watching that going on with me for a long time. The whole summer. I mean, it's not even just the, the whippings and the beatings. It was a it's making me stand out in the middle of the field all day and all night with no clothes on to see how sunburned I could get, and then make me go sleep on a hard bed made with military wool blankets. You know, just burn your skin all night. Anyway, um, it, there's a lot of things going on out, and it would be in the public there. I mean, you're really easy to spot. If you just sat and watched that farm for a few days, you'd see that stuff going on. And I think that. They're watching farms. I think it's, we're entertainment to them. I think they sit and watch what humans do, and they are entertained. And maybe this Sasquatch was uh, horrified by it and just saw me, just happened to see me in a situation, heard me screaming, and went, you know, I'm going to just pluck this kid out of here and whatever and not do what's been done to him. I don't know exactly. It doesn't, you know, it didn't talk to me, so I don't really know. It just Yeah, it's hard to say, and it could have killed you just as quickly, too. Yeah, we just not done anything. Could just went about his way and just let me drown. Yeah. I'm real sure I would not have made it across there. I would never have made it across. Yeah, it was still getting deeper as I was going into it. It was actually still getting deeper, and I would never have been able to. I wasn't going to make it back. Once I lost my boots, I was done. I wasn't going to make it. Well, it's definitely a fascinating account, Tommy, and I I really do appreciate you coming on and and sharing. I know you, I know you didn't really want to, and I know it was tough to relive. I can imagine when you when you relive. A, I know what it's like to relive a Sasquatch encounter, but to try and relive, I don't even know if I want to call it abuse. I almost want to call it torture uh, that you went through. I know that's even harder. And again, thank you so much for coming on. I I, I really do appreciate that, and I mean that. You really have a, a an integrity and a humbleness about you that makes it easy to talk to you about it, and that's a rare thing in this world nowadays. Not being egomaniac and. Um, I mean, whatever. I mean, I just think you, you do a fantastic thing, and, and I think it can probably be overwhelming to you, or you know, same old, same old all the time. But you really are doing a huge service to, for this for the people in this country. Well, thank you for the kind words, Tommy. I really do appreciate it very much. Thanks for your time, Wes. Have a good night. You too, Tommy. Thank you again. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone. i
is mine.